Good day. Welcome to the second lesson on the analytical skills, the scientific method in this further studies in physics course. So today we're going to focus on uncertainties and significant figures. So we this is extremely important in experimental physics because every measurement, no matter whether it's done at the Large Hadron Collider, where they've spent billions and billions of euros to ensure that they have the most sophisticated experiments and detection apparatus that minimize the uncertainty, there's always uncertainty. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is one of the fundamental principles on which the universe seems to work. So uncertainty cannot be eliminated. So in this second lesson, second session, we are going to look at distinguishing between random and systematic errors in measurements, distinguish between precision and accuracy. We're going to calculate the uncertainty in a derived quantity. That is particularly important. And then calculate quantities and results of calculations to the appropriate number of significant figures. So this is truly a very, very important skill. These are important skills that you are able to master in order to be able to do real science, whether it's IYPT at the moment, if you're, if you're going to do International Young Physicist Tournament, participate in that, or whether it is the um, you're going to go on and you're going to study engineering uh, and astrophysics or physics and chemistry and become a professional physicist or chemist or scientist, this you're going to use for the rest of your professional life. So uncertainty and error in measurement. So physics is an experimental science. As much as what we love, you need the theory and you need theoretical physicists. Ultimately, one needs experimental physicists to prove that which theoretical physicists postulate, put forward. Perfect example of this is that Peter Higgs was, is, is a theoretical physicist who predicted the Higgs boson and the Higgs mechanism in the 1960s. But it took over 50 years in order for experimental science, experimental physics to catch up, to have the technology to be able to produce the collisions in the Large Hadron Collider that simulated the energy density at the beginning of the universe so that the Higgs boson could be detected. So at the end of the day, I know that sometimes theoretical physicists, certainly at the university that I was at, theoretical physicists thought they were a little bit better than experimental physicists. Some of them actually thought they were very much better. At the end of the day, without experimental physicists, we can't prove what the theoretical physicists put forward. And so all measurements in science, all measurements in science, they suffer from uncertainty, which results from unavoidable errors. There's uncertainty. We have a measurement. It can be 10, 3, 2, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But it, there will be an uncertainty no matter how accurate or precise your experiment is, your measurement is, there's going to be uncertainty. So no matter how hard we try to control things, some level of experimental error is, is there. Uh, and the source of error may be a number of things which we're going to explore. And it's critically important, critically important, that when one reports one's results, that one does so in such a way that you have calculated the uncertainty in your measured values. I know personally, being a juror at the International Young Physicist Tournament, I have seen how year after year after year, how the teams challenge each other on their calculations of uncertainty. Uh, when they put up the error bars or the uncertainty bars, uh, they are they are asked, so how did you work that out? Or why are your error bars so big? Or why are your error bars so small? Was, you, was your experiment actually that accurate? So this is really very important. So it's crucial to know the following. 
that an error is the difference between the measured value from your experiment and the expected value of something. All right. So basically on school level, you are going to, whatever experiments you do, are not going to be as accurate as those done performed in a professional physics lab. So it's very cold today, so I need, I need my warm coffee to keep me going. So the error is the difference between the measured value and the expected value or the more accurate value. Uncertainty is a way of expressing or summarizing the error. All right, so your uncertainty is invariably as a number. It's a quantity. It's a quantified. It's a quantified error. You're 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 basically the error is causing the uncertainty, right? So you it's it, you you actually measure you, you you give a number. It could be a percentage or it could be an absolute uncertainty, as we will see. A mistake is just simply not doing something that you should have done. Um, and so it, it's through carelessness and it is avoidable. Uh, if you're a good scientist, uh, you're going to eliminate your mistakes, but you won't eliminate error. Uh, it does say yeah, that error is not the same as uncertainty, though both are unavoidable. Uh, we often use them in a similar way, but in pure physics, they're actually not the same. So when you calculate the error, it's the measured value minus the accepted value. So let me give an example. Let's say, for instance, we, we measure the accepted value for the gravitational constant, let's say it's 9,81 meters per second squared. That's the accepted value. Okay. We have more accurate values, up to four or five decimal places. But let's assume Yang Cape Town, accepted value G is 9,81. However, we now go and we do some experiments and we find that we get that G is 9,9. .9. Okay, so then the error would be 9,9, .9, our measured value, minus 9,81. All right, so the error would be 9,9 .9 minus 9,81 would give us error of naught. 0 0.09 0.09 okay 9.9 .9 minus 9.81 will be 0 0.09 i hope my son my arithmetic is good if we wanted our percentage error we would have to take the 0 0.09 and divide it by the acceptable value so the error indicates how far off a measurement is or an observation is from the, what's considered the accurate value. So errors can arise due to instrumentation limitations. Very often in a school lab, we don't have the state of the art equipment. So for instance, in my lab, we've got mass scales that measure the mass to one decimal place. And we have, I think, two that measure to two decimal places. They are significantly more expensive if they measure to two decimal places. But they are not as accurate as what you would use, for instance, at a university, which could measure to three or four decimal places. All right. Human error. Human error. We reaction times, uh, error of parallax, uh, skew eyes, bad eyes. These things can all... <laughs> contribute to uh, errors. Calibration issues. Has the, has the measuring instrument actually been calibrated properly? And then there are external influences, like, for instance, temperature changes, uh, pressure changes that have been unaccounted for. So there are two main types of error. The one is a, system, a, a systematic error, which is a consistent or predictable deviation from the true value. So you find it's constant, okay? it's systemic, it's a systematic error. It can arise from flaws in equipment, experimental setup, or measurement procedures. So for instance, let's say I use my scale and do stoichiometric calculations with my grade 10s, and I don't zero the scale. And when I 
start measuring it's 0 0.3, at least 0 0.2 grams. And I measure, make my measurements with different samples. Then that's a systematic error. Every single one of those measurements will have an error of 0.2 grams because I didn't zero the scale. Random errors, they are unpredictable variations in measurement. Um, measurement conditions or human judgment. This leads to inconsistent deviations in both the positive and the negative direction. So it, they can vary. Um, you know, it can be that I'm, for instance, measuring the length of a metal strip. And today it's cold, let's say it's 15 degrees. Tomorrow I do another measurement and it's warmer, it's 20 degrees. And the following day I do another measurement. And on that day it's five degrees. And I measure and I go like, well, wait a minute, there's, there's a variation. So I make an average. Um, I'm not and I'm not taking the temperature into account. Uh, that that is a random error. Okay, so fluctuations in environmental conditions and operation of measuring instrument. These are random errors. So un uncertainty is a broader concept that encompasses the range of possible values within which a true value may appear, and this becomes very important for us. Uh, this shows us that when we make a measurement, so let's say we take g equals 9,8, 1. We say, okay, our measurement is 9,9. .9. However, we have worked out that the uncertainty is between 9,8 and 10. So plus or minus 0.1 on either side of the 9,9. .9. Then you can see that the accurate value of 9,81 actually falls within that range. Okay. So this takes into account both systematic and random errors, as well as the limitations of measuring equipment and procedures. So uncertainty, you can have an error, right, caused by something or a set of things. But your uncertainty basically covers all of them and says, well, okay, doesn't necessarily specify what these errors are, but the uncertainty we say, well, okay, in taking in account all of these things, we've worked out that this is our value, but it falls within, this is the value, but it's in the middle of an interval of uncertainties, positive and negative on both sides. So there are two main types of uncertainty, also systematic uncertainty, which is um, consistent and there's a known direction, positive or negative, often arise from imperfect measuring instruments. Like I've mentioned, a weighing scale that is, has not been zeroed. Random uncertainties, also known as statistical uncertainty, due to random variations in measurements. All right, it's typically quantified using statistical methods like standard deviation and reflects the range of values that could reasonably be expected to encompass the true value. So, Recently, I was at CERN, as you know, uh, or you might not know if you're now watching this years into the future. Uh, this is August, 24th of August, 2023. In July, I was at CERN. It's probably just been a few weeks there. And we had lectures on the Higgs boson. And when it came to the analysis of the data, that it was extracted from the Atlas detector and the CMS detector at CERN, where they observed the collisions of the clusters of protons. They collected data, collected data, collected data, and eventually around about 120 uh, giga electron volts, there was a little peak in the observational data that actually came out. And that little peak was an indicator that something was happening there that was outside of the norm. And that peak eventually was the proof of the Higgs boson, about 122 giga, giga electron volts. However, I remember pre throughout the two weeks that I was there, them talking about how they had to, they had to statistically analyze that this wasn't just a random fluctuation and uncertainty in the data. And so they worked with, I think it's five standard deviations that it was impossible for it to just be 
uh, a deviation, it's a random deviation, that this was something that was actually real. It wasn't just a, a deviation. It wasn't just a random uncertainty. So, Yao's yeah, examples of error, and I'm going to read it to you. So, it says, let's say a scientist is conducting an experiment to measure the speed of sound in air. Due to the calibration issue in the timer used to measure the time it takes for sound to travel a certain distance, the scientist consistently records times that are 0.2 seconds too long. Okay, this is a, a systematic error that affects every measurement and results in an inaccurate calculation of the speed of sound. All right, so this is why scientists go to great lengths, and sometimes it's years to get the equipment right to the point where they minimize systematic error. So, for instance, astronomers that are measuring very, very, very faint um, signals from outer space will cool the measuring apparatus down to near minus 273 degrees Celsius, zero Kelvin, to reduce the ambient fluctuations and radiations caused by vibrating atoms and molecules. And they'll go to great lengths to do that in order to ensure that their instrumentation measures as accurately as what they possibly can. And they are at the point now where they can actually differentiate between temperature measurements from outer space to the millikelvin when it comes to observing the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now let's look at the con in the example of the uncertainty. So continuing with the speed of sound experiment, even if the scientist corrects the systematic error in measurement, there will be uncertainty in the measurement due to factors like variations in temperature, pressure, and other environmental conditions. These are random measurement errors. Eh? The uncertainty might be expressed as a range. The speed of sound is measured to be 340 meters per second with an uncertainty of plus or minus 5 meters per second on either side indicating that the true value is likely to fall within that range. And so this is so, so hugely, hugely important because if you're going to be a scientist, you're going to have to, an experimental scientist, you are going to have to be honest about the limitations of your experiment. Um, and you need to actually spend a lot of time when you do your data analysis to also do error analysis to actually see, okay, your, your, expect, your value that you've measured after repeated experimentation, averaging out analysis, that, okay, now, what is the values, the average value is this, but what is the uncertainty range? And you can't just thumb suck, you need to work it out, as we are going to do a little later on. So in summary, Error refers, so in summary, error refers to the discrepancy between a measured value and the true value. While uncertainty accounts for the range of potential values measured around, around the measured value due to sources of variation and limitation. So this is really very important. This is very important. So error refers to the discrepancy between a measured value and the true value. While uncertainty accounts for the range of potential values around the measured value due to various sources. However, even when you talk about the true value, there's uncertainty in the true value. So there's no absolute certainty uh, in any measured value. So our strategy in dealing with uncertainties and errors is to minimize them, obviously, but at the same time to be honest about them by reporting them truthfully. And when we make a measurement, we generally assume that some exact or true value exists based on how what we're doing is being what on how what is being measured. Okay. Now, however, like I've just said, all right, we will refer to the most accurate measurement done made to date. But even in that, there is an uncertainty. So while we may never know this true value exactly, we attempt to find this ideal quantity to the best of our ability with the time and resources of it. So science is, should be, science should be 
a process that is a humble process. It should be one where we continually acknowledge the uncertainty in the era, but don't let it cause us to stop and say give up. Okay. So precision and accuracy. So accuracy is the closeness of agreement between a measured value and a true accepted value. So if something is accurate, the error is going to be small. Remember, the error is the difference between the measured value and, and the accepted value. So if you if you if you have a accurate if you have an accurate measurement, it's in close agreement with right. Precision is the measure of degree of consistency among the independent measurements of the same quantity. So it's about reliability and reproducibility. So uh, you're going to see, and I think a very good analogy is the following. And I'd like you to take a look at it carefully. I just want to switch off this bank of lights on the front now. The ambient light is changing. It's now becoming very, very reflective. Sorry about that. I think that's a bit better. All right. Okay. So now, if we think of playing darts and the goal is to throw the dart at the bullseye, there. then if we look at these four throws, you'll see that they are definitely not accurate. Because that is where we're aiming for. That, in the analogy, the bull's eye is the accepted value. So this is the accepted value. These are the measurements. We can see they're not accurate. But they're also quite widely distributed. So they're also not precise. Okay. Yeah, we can see that they are becoming more accurate. The average value would be close to the bull's eye, but they're not precise because they're all over the show. Yeah, they're very precise. We can see that the, the spread of the measurements is close, but its average is off course. So if you had to take the average here, you would see the average would be somewhere there, which is far from the accepted value. Yeah, the average is near the accepted value, but the spread is wide, so it's not precise. Yeah, it's precise, but it's not accurate. Pah! That's what we're looking for. We're looking for that the average is basically right next to the bullseye, if not the bullseye. And the distribution is such that it's narrow, so it's precise. So that's what we aim for when we do our when we perform experiment experiments. Right, so so precision is really about detail. It has nothing to do with accuracy. Accuracy is about giving the true readings, not detailed readings. So um, as it says, imagine that you have many measured values of the same thing. If you and your instruments were perfect, every single measurement would be exactly the same. But in reality, you end up with a normal distribution of data. And the area under the curve between two measurements is basically the number of measurements in that range of values. So we, if this is the number, this is the number of values, a number of measurements, and this is the values of the measurements. You can see this is the number of measurements. The number of measurements is the value of a particular quantity. Then you can see here that for this value, there was a large number of measurements. For this value, a large number. So if you take the area, the integral under this, the total number of measurements that fall within that range. And as when I was at CERN, there was this beautiful animation where they actually showed how the data that in search of the Higgs boson, how the data built up, built up and built up and built up. And slowly but surely you could actually see the peak coming out. And so this is what scientists do in the real world. So 
Here's an example of an ammeter has a zero offset error. What that means is it wasn't zeroed properly. Yeah. Um, this fault will affect neither the precision nor the accuracy of the readings. Definitely not true. It's going to definitely affect the accuracy. Only the precision of the readings. Well, not necessarily. I mean, you could be precise. You could be reading, making repeated readings, and they're pretty precise, but around the wrong value. Only the accuracy of the reading. So, so the fact that the this is a systematic, it's a systematic error. Your your instrument has not been zero. So every measurement is going to have the same minimum error in it. Both the precision and the accuracy of the reading. So the precision, it won't affect the precision. All right, it will affect the accuracy. Example two, a voltmeter has a zero offset error. Once again, the readings on a constant potential difference is made for four times by a student. The readings are 1, 176, 1, 178, 1, 177, 1, 176. The student averages these readings, but does not take into account the zero offset error. So it doesn't take into account. Let's say there's a let's say there's a comma five volt offset error. Right. If it doesn't take that comma five volts error into account, then uh, it's not accurate, all right? It definitely is precise because you can see in the third decimal, it only varies around about one, maybe two volt, uh, 0 0.001 volt, 0 0.002 volt max. So it's precise, but it's not accurate. So, this is so important that I would like us to review it again. All right. So basically, you get random and systematic errors. Random errors refer to random fluctuations in the measured data due to the readability, the effects of something changing in the surroundings, and the observer being less than perfect. Random errors can be reduced by averaging, and we generally do that. We average out. That's the first statistical uh, method that we teach you on school level is basically to average out. So you take five readings, like when we did the pendulum experiment with measuring the period, we would normally we would say, okay, you measure, you measure five or ten oscillations and then you average out. You take the total time and divide it by five or ten and then you repeat the experiment and then you divide then you find the average of those averages and work out a more accurate value so systematic errors uh, refer to reproducible fluctuations so basically you use an instrument that isn't zeroed properly you, it, no matter if you do it a million times over you're going to have that error it's going to happen all the time. So it's not going to be random. It's going to be there. It's systematic. So an instrument being wrongly calibrated, an instrument with a zero error, does not read zero when it should. So the value should be subtracted from every reading. And then the observer being less than perfect in the same way during each measurement. So systematic errors cannot be detected or reduced by taking more measurements. So this is why we start to graph. Okay, when graphing experimental data, you can see immediately if you're dealing with random or systematic errors, if you compare it with the theoretical expected results. All right, so this is why graphing becomes so important. All right, so if we look here, all right, you can see here, here's the measured value. And let's say this is the true value. All right. So your random fluctuations will be, so here's your, these are the true values, these are measured values. Your random fluctuations, you would see your, your points on either side of the line of best fit. With the year, you can see there's a systematic error. From the start, there was something wrong there, and it was consistent all the way through. That's a systematic error. So that, for instance, would be, let's say, for instance, let's say this was uh, mass versus volume, right? Um, 
and initially your mass value wasn't zero, well, that's going to be a problem all the way through. So, so when we, with both random and systematic errors present in a particular quantity, what changes, if any, would repeat measurements of this quantity have on the random and systematic errors? Well, uh, so if you repeat the measurements and you've got random and systematic errors in your measurement, if you repeat, your random is going to be reduced, especially if you average it out, but your systematic is going to remain unchanged. Okay? All right, so that is the correct answer. That this looks more bold, but it's just, it's, this isn't the correct answer. Okay, so now we come to significant figures. Now, significant figures generally in the normal physical science syllabus, we, we're not too finicky about it. We normally just say, okay, round off to two decimal places, round off to three decimal places. At Parklands, we choose in FET to round off to three decimal places. But strictly speaking, one should be working more with, when it comes to experimental physics, one needs to be well aware of your, the significant figures that you're actually able to use. So let's look at the rules for counting significant Non-zero digits, non-zero integers, always count as significant figures. Okay. So here you've got three non-zero digits. They are three significant figures. Leading zeros are zeros that precede all the non-zero digits. Okay. These do not count as significant figures. All right. So here, one, two, three, four, five. We've, it's accurate up to well. Let's say we've presented it as four decimal places, but it's only two significant figures, what we call loosely sig figs. There are only two sig figs there. Okay. These leading zeros are not significant. Not so that they are significant because of the fact that they're there. No, they, 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 they do not speak to the precision or the accuracy and how good the measurement is. This is significant. Captive zeros. Captive zeros are unlike the leading zeros which are in the front. Captive zeros are between two non-zero digits. They are definitely significant. All right. So yeah, you've got four significant figures. Yeah, you've got four significant figures. Trailing zeros are zeros at the end of the number, and in general they. In, in general, assume they are significant only if there is a decimal that is specified. Okay, so, all right, let's just get, this is where it gets tricky. Okay, so you are trailing zeros there, all right? Because there isn't a decimal specified, it, we cannot say that the measurement was accurate to the nearest unit. So one is significant. So basically what we can say here is this is accurate to within 100 hundreds. Okay. So um, this could be 110, could be 120, it could be, it could be 110, it could be 90. So this is one significant figure. As soon as we put in a decimal, you can see then the zeros do count. The leading zeros. Then we're saying that this experiment, for instance, let's say this is a mass experiment, mass measurement, that this was 1.00 grams, that this was actually measured on a scale that is accurate to two decimal places. This 100 with a comma, we're saying, well, the measurement was up to, was measured accurately up to there. So this is three significant. Same as here, three significant. So just remember, they are leading. Leading zeros are not significant. Captive zeros between non-zero digits are significant, and leading trailing zeros only if there is a decimal point in in the actual measurement. Right. Rules for operations: multiplication or division. 
So the number of significant figures in the result is the same as the number in the least precise, the least precise measurement used in the calculation. So if you've got 99,1 divided by 1,11, okay, right, and we get the answer there, we say, okay, so what have we got here? We have got a string of decimals. Now, normally, in the physical science syllabus, we go like, okay, it's called you round up to two decimal places, round up to three decimal places. But in experimental physics, you actually don't have a right to do that. Because rounding off to two or three decimal places, you're actually saying that that measurement is more is better than what it actually is. That it's more accurate than what it really is, what well, it's more precise than what it really is. So, so what do we do? Well, how many significant figures do we have in 99,1? Well, we have three. How many significant figures do we have in 1,11? We have three. So therefore, we can only use the minimum amount of significant figures in either of the measurements, and that's three. So it's 89,2. All right. Let's say we had 1,11, 1, 1, 1, there. We only had two sig figs. Well, then it would only we'd have to go up to 89. 89, comma, 89, comma, 0. No, not 89, comma, 0. 89. All right. With addition or subtraction, once again, addition and subtraction, the result is this has the same number of decimal places as the least precise measurement used in the calculation. So your limiting number, precision-wise, your limiting number is the one with the least significant figures. All right. So always remember that as a rule. All right. You cannot state more significant figures in your answer than the least precise number measurement you've used in your calculations. So for instance, here, if we look here, we have got uh, yeah, we've got 99,1 plus 1,1543, all right? And now, if you look here, this one has got three significant figures. This one has got one, two, three, four, five significant figures. But the answer is that. But now, three significant figures is the least. And I'm going to say that this is actually wrong. This should read 100, comma. Not three, because there would be four sig figs. So that was incorrect. This is 100 with the comma. Because remember, if you don't put the comma, then that's one significant figure. Put the decimal there, then it's three significant figures. So to round to a significant figure, okay, look at the first non-zero digit if rounding to one significant figure. Look at the digit after the first non-zero digit if rounding off to two significant figures. Then draw a vertical line after the place value digit that is required and then look at the next digit. If it's five or more, you increase the previous digit by one. If it's four or less, you keep the previous digit the same. Okay, you've learned this with rounding off. Fill any spaces to the right of the line with zero, stopping at the decimal point if there is one. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So we've got 53,879, and we want to round to one significant figure, okay, and then to two significant figures. So we go to 53,879, all right, and we go to the third, so we're rounding off to one significant figure. We draw a line there. That the first non zero digit, so the first significant digit, we draw a line, we round it off to one significant figure. We now look at that number there. It's less than five. So therefore, we round it off to zero. So this becomes five, zero, 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 zero. So we round off to, it becomes 50. Okay? Comma zero, zero. Okay. Um, I am going to debate. Oh, this is these are notes that I'm using here, right? But I'm actually going to say that we would not have this like this. To one significant figure, 
this would be 50. Because if we put a decimal in there, then it's going to be to two decimal places. So we're rounding off to one significant figure. If we're rounding off to two significant figures, okay, we go to first significant figure, second significant figure, now we draw a line, now we look to the right of it. And you see this 8 is 5 or more, so we make it 10, which makes it 54. And here, okay, we can write it as 54 or 54 comma. All right. Notice that the number of significant figures in the question is the maximum number of non-zero digits in your answer. As you can see. Round 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 0, 8, 9 to one significant figure. Then two significant figures. One, once again, we go to the, from the left to the first non-zero digit, which is the first significant figure. All right, we're going to draw a line there. And we look to the right. That naught is less than 5. So it just remains it's naught. So it's naught, 0, 0, 5. We look there, one significant if we go to 2, then remember, the 0 here is significant, okay, because it's squeezed between the 5 and that. It's a, cap a, captured, a captured 0, okay? So we can then we draw a line there okay, next to the, to the right of the second significant figure, and then we see up at the 8 is closer to 10 than to, to 0. 5 or more, so we make it 10, which becomes 1, 0.005. This is very, very important. Okay, so when reporting a single measurement, and apologies for that, I must have pressed something. I'm uh, not too sure what happened there. When reporting a single measurement, most people report a measured value incorrectly. They, they make it more accurate than what it really is. All right. Um, they express more certainty in the reported value than what really exists. So generally, we report the measured value of something with the decimal place of precision going not beyond the smallest graduation, called the least count of the instrument. Okay, so let me give an example. All right, I've got a ruler here. Okay, this ruler, the smallest count on this ruler is a millimeter. All right, so I cannot say that this is a hundred that, let's say, for instance, if I, if I take this and I measure the length now, I go, okay, this is, it says 11, it looks like 11 and a half centimeters. So I can say, well, this is 115 centimeters, 115 millimeters, my apologies. But I can't say this is 115,1 millimeter, because the least count on this ruler is a millimeter. And so I'm then going to say this is 115 millimeters, give or take, plus or minus a millimeter on either side. So in the case where the least counts are wide enough to estimate beyond the uncertainty, you may do so. It is ultimately up to the experiment to determine how to report a measured value. But be conservative. I can assure you, sometimes on a ruler you can go, well, that looks like halfway between it, half of a millimeter. So therefore, it's 115,5. But that's not being conservative. It's better to say this is 115 millimeters, give or take a millimeter on either side. Because tomorrow it's warmer and it expands. And you say, well, okay, but these two materials don't expand in the same way. They're made up of different plastics. So it's always better to, to be more conservative when expressing your certainty than to be uh, very optimistic about the precision and the accuracy of your measurements. All right, so instrument uncertainty should be stated as plus or minus, the least count, and match the number of decimal places of the reported measurement. And certainty should also have only one significant, and certainties should also only have one significant figure. So if we take, for instance, here, let's look at this measurement here. All right. Okay, and this is the sort of problem we would get in a test exam. Let's look at that. 
If we look at this, firstly, we're working in milliampers. So this is five milliampers. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. All right. So if we look at this, this is one milliampere, that's two milliampere. So if you look at the, the graduation in between, one, two, three, four, five, there are five increments between one and two milliampere. So that's one milliampere divided by five gives us 0 0.2 milliampere. So each one of these, each one of these, This is the least count, is 0.2 milliampers. 1, 1 divided by 5 is 0.2. All right, now if we look here at this reading, we've got 1. We've got 1, 2, 1, 4, 1, 6. So this reading there. So this reading here looks like 1, 6 milliampers. But now remember the least count is 0.2. So the uncertainty is an umbrella term it takes into account the possible errors. So for instance, the is this is not a 10 million dollar milliammeter its calibration might not be that great it could be that today is really hot and this is an analog uh, milliammeter and some of the components inside have expanded and contracted right it could also be that the experimenter maybe at a late night last night marking scripts and is also not reading it exactly. Maybe he's got eyes like me with thick glasses and they don't read it exactly as it is. So the uncertainty covers all of them. So, well, okay, conservatively, the least count is 0.2 milliammeters. So we are going to say that this is 1.6 milliammeters, give or take 0.2 milliammeters on either side. So 1.6, give or take 0.2. Now, that is, that is an acceptable uncertainty. We can say, okay, you're not pushing it here. You're not, you're not being overly optimistic, but you're also not being overly pessimistic. So that's the least count. So therefore, that reading would be, we would state it as this reading is that the current that is measured is 1.6 plus or minus 0.2 milliammeters. And notice that we've only put in one sig fig. Okay. Let's take a look at the next one. Yeah, now we have a particular object and we're measuring its length. All right. Now, if you look closely at this, it's nice with an iPad that you can zoom it out. And you see you've got one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters. Each of these is a millimeter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten millimeters in a centimeter. All right. If we go here, if we look at this, the least count, the least count, the least count. is one millimeter on this particular ruler. So when we measure this, we measure it there. All right. Okay, uh, I'm looking at this and I would go like, okay, if you're measuring from there to there, you should be measuring actually, yeah, but, okay, if you look at there, there, but that is actually a systematic error, can you see, if you measure, you should actually be measuring there, you should be measuring to there, 
not a retro. Okay, let's look at the diagram. Let's assume, let's assume that it's correct. If you want to work here with the with the um, this. Okay, so looking there, can you see that we're looking at this is two point, this is 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. Now, do we have a right to say this is 27 and a half millimeters? Is it 27 and a half millimeters? Okay, well, um, I would say not. So you'd rather go conservative. If you're working with plus or minus one millimeter, so I don't want that to look like one centimeter. This should be one millimeter. My apologies. Bad handwriting. Right. This should be one millimeter. Okay. So if we do this reading, okay, you can see two comma seven. Okay, and they've got plus or minus 0.1 centimeters. So I would write this and say that this is 27 plus or minus 1 millimeter. 27 plus or minus 1 millimeter. All right. Uh, as I have alluded to the fact that there, I believe there is an actual fact a, a, a method error here. And if you're doing it like this, you should actually this if if this looked like that and you were measuring it is a bit of a perspective thing All right and you were measuring from that side the drawing is bad okay the drawing is bad i mean it's a bit like if i take this and i'm going to measure its length all right i'm going to measure its length Okay, this is more, it's more trying to represent a three-dimensional on, on object on a two-dimensional plane. You, you would measure it like this. You would go like, okay, there's naught. And we would measure it, remove error of parallax. And this would be, it looks like it's about 28 millimeters. It would be 28, so not, uh, it's 100, sorry, 280. 200, not 200. 208 millimeters plus or minus one millimeter. Okay, cool. So, if we look here, this is this is uh, one of our uh, star program disks. So, this is Blue Shift Aerospace, and this is a disk that was given to me, and now I'm using a ruler see there can you see nine millimeters we've got 10 20 30 40 50 uh let's see that's 10 millimeters 20 millimeters 30 millimeters 40 millimeters 50 millimeters 60 millimeters 70 millimeters you see there you open up there 71 72 73 74 all right 74 millimeters 7.4 centimeters okay measure them the diameter of the colored disk, assuming assuming we've gone right through the center. It could be a systematic error there as well. Okay, but now looking there, if each of these is 10 millimeters, which is one centimeter, okay, then this is going to be 71, 72, 73, 74. 74 millimeters plus or minus one millimeter. Why? Because the least count on my measuring instrument is one millimeter. Okay. So let's talk about absolute and percentage uncertainties. Okay. Absolute uncertainties are expressed as plus or minus the number of units in the measurement. Okay. So like we've been working with absolute uncertainties. Um, length plus or minus two millimeters. Milliamperes plus or minus 0.2 milliamperes. Those are absolute. So this tells you immediately the maximum and minimum experimental values of the measurement. So your maximum value there would be 236 millimeters, uh, and your minimum measurement would be 232 millimeters. Okay. All right. So all uncertainties begin as absolute uncertainty, stated according to the uncertainty and the precision of the instrument. Percentage in uncertainties are expressed as plus or minus. 
right? And then they take the, they convert the absolute uncertainty, delta X, into a percentage comparing it to accepted value times by 100%, okay? So should I say the measured value? Okay, so for instance, up there, absolute percentage would be 234, plus or minus two millimeters. Your absolute uncertainty is two millimeters. Now you say you convert the two millimeters to a percentage. So two divided by 234 times 100 gives us that the percentage is plus or minus 85%, uh, 8.5%, and this is in millimeters. So we put the, the percentage uncertainty in brackets. Percentage uncertainties are unitless and can save lots of time in making calculations, even though it seems cumbersome to express this uncertainty. You'll see in certain cases if needed, you have to work with percentage uncertainty. Makes things a little bit more complicated, but it's necessary. So calculating uncertainty in a derived quantity. So if your data is to be added or subtracted, then we use absolute uncertainty. Okay, so if I've got a quantity A and a quantity B, and each of the quantities have got absolute uncertainties, plus or minus delta A, plus or minus delta B, right, and we add them together, then we're going to add the measured values A and B together, and we'll add the uncertainties. So by adding, we're saying, well, the maximum absolute uncertainties when we add them together, be plus or minus. So we're accounting for the uncertainty in both. We do the same with subtraction. We add the uncertainty. So add the absolute uncertainty. We always go conservative. We always look at what is the maximum uncertainty that we're aware of. Then it gets a little bit more complicated is when we start to multiply quantities. If data is to be multiplied or divided, we add not the absolute uncertainties. We add the percentage uncertainty. And this is why we need to work with percentage uncertainty. So if data is being multiplied or divided, we then add the percentage uncertainties. If, if data is being added or subtracted, we add the absolute uncertainty. So we always add, we always add, because adding gives you the maximum uncertainty. So for instance, here, yeah, if you've got A plus delta A times B plus, plus or minus delta B, we are not going to use FOIL. Okay? You're not going to do this algebraically and use first out as in as last. What you're going to do, you're going to multiply A and B, and then you're going to work out the percentage uncertainties of each of the measurements and then add to get a percentage uncertainty for the calculated value. The same is as if we divide, okay? We divide the measured values, A over B, but then we add the percentage uncertainties. And if data is to be raised, then what we do, and I apologize for this, this is, load shedding has come to an end. We've had a two hour period between eight and 10. So I'm just waiting for this. It's, there's nothing I can do about this. It's gonna take a minute or two. I do apologize, I'm gonna just go, pause here and go and have a grab a coffee. I'm just waiting for it to come back. Just give me a, a minute or two. See if we come back on. Yep, there we go.
Okay, so if, if we are raising a quantity to a power, then basically we're taking that quantity and multiplying it in times, which means we're going to add its percentage error in times. So in other words, we just times it by n. So uh, this is basically just an extension of that. Right, so now this is really important. So examples are consider the following objects. You've got two lamina. Uh, the one is rectangular and the one is square. And this one has got a length that's been measured with the least count of one millimeter. This one's been measured with the least count of comma one. So this has obviously been measured with the more, the one on the right has been measured with a more accurate instrument. Okay. So the length here has an absolute error of plus of one millimeter, plus or minus uh, uncertainty. And this one has a plus or minus one millimeter uncertainty. This one has a plus or minus 0.1 millimeter uncertainty. So calculate the area of A. Now the area is length times breadth. So we're going to be multiplying length times breadth. All right, and we measure, so we multiply it. Okay. So now because we're multiplying, length times breadth is easy. Uh, that's going to give us, the length times the breadth is 120 mils times uh, 60 millimeters gives us 7,200 square millimeters. Easy peasy. But what isn't easy is that we, is the uncertainty. So what we need to do is we need to take the uncertainties of delta L and delta B we need to convert them into percentage, into percentage uncertainties. Right, so we take the delta L, which is 1, and we divide by 120, and that times 100 gives us a comma 8%. Okay. Then we take the delta B, 1 mole, divided by that 160, times by 100 gives us 1.7%. Right, so now... When we work out the area, okay, length times breadth, we add the percentage errors. So this is going to be 0.8 plus 1.7, and that's going to give us 2.5. And strictly speaking, if we work with significant with a uh, one significant figure, then we should make that a three percent error. Notice we added the percentage errors. Now, if we look at B, B has got a smaller uncertainty, 0.1 moles. So we work out the percentage error, delta L, 0.1 over 100.1, that gives us 0.1%. But the area is length times length, which is length squared. So delta L over L, that's the percentage error. And notice you could have just times by two. Okay? Added them, we get plus 0.2%, plus or minus 0.2%. So this one, this one is roughly a 3% error. That's or minus a 3% error. And this one is a 0.2%. Not error, uncertainty. Okay. Right, because it was measured with a with a simpler measuring instrument, but yeah, no. <laughs> what happens when we want the total area? Total area. Now we want to add area A and area B, but they've been measured with different instruments. So what we do now is remember when you add quantities, you need to add the absolute uncertainty. So we have the two quantities. But now we need to work out the uncertainty. So the, the absolute uncertainty of area A is 2.5 over 100 times 7,200 square millimeters, which is basically 180 square moles. And for the absolute uncertainty for area B is 0.2 times 10,020 square moles. Millimeters gives us 20. And so now, when we work out the total area, it's 
adding the two areas together, 17,220 square millimeters. And now we add the absolute errors because we were adding the quantities. Gets tricky, gets tricky. So let's use an example of a cylinder. A cylinder has a radius of 1.6 millimeters plus or minus 0 0.0, sorry, not 1.6 plus or minus 0 0.01 centimeters, and a height of 11.5 plus or minus 0.1 centimeters. Find the volume. Right. And if we do this, the volume is V equals pi r squared h. We have to work out the percentage errors, percentage uncertainties for each of them. So 0 0.01 over 1.6 times 100 gives us 0.625. Delta H is 0.1 over 11.5 times 100% gives us 0.87. Now we say V equals pi squared times uh, pi times uh, 1.6 squared times 11.5 pi squared H. We get that. But now, now, we need, yeah, we've got the square of a unit, so we need to times its percentage error by 2, or add it, because it's 1.6 times 1.6, so add the percentage error of 0.625 plus 0.625, multiplied by 11,5 centimeters, and that's got an uncertainty of 0.87, so we Basically, adding them all together, we get 2.12%. All right. And working on the rule of one significant figure, that should just be plus or minus 2%. We should take away the 0.12 there. But now, if we multiply out to get the absolute uncertainty, we take the 92,5 and we multiply by 92 uh, by uh, 2,12, which is percent 0.0212. We get 1.96 square centimeters. Uh, that is the uncertainty, which is 2 square centimeters. All right, notice one significant figure. And now, if we look at the significant figures, can you see that the minimum amount of significant figures in each of the measurements was 3? And so we can use 3. This is the kind of problem you could get. So, with that, I end what has been a very, quite a long lesson. Uh, very important section. I, I hope that you uh, have benefited from it. And then, when I see you again, will be the last section of this, uh, this topic. And also for my 2023 grade 12s will be the official last lesson that finishes the syllabus. So all the best. Thank you very much. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.